is leading Aki Lab's effort to build a collaborative spatial computing protocol to allow for shared AR experiences. I'm really excited to hear more about it. Thank you, Niels, for uh, spending time with us today. Hey, Andy, thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone from, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, from where it's technically the future already. It's uh, Thursday morning here. Uh, the future is looking bright. Um, these previous two talks have just been uh, absolutely riveting, and there's there's so much I, I want to talk about now. And I think I'd, I'd like to jump off of the question, like, when will we see consumer AR glasses? And I'm going to throw a contrarian take into this and say that Apple has not really moved the needle on consumer AR glasses. The whole industry is looking the wrong direction. We're not waiting for a smaller, better headset. We're waiting for something much more fundamental. We're waiting for the ability to have shared AR experiences. Let me explain. Today, digital devices like your phone or your glasses have a very, very poor understanding of where they are in space. You have a GPS, sure, but my GPS barely knows I'm in this building. It certainly doesn't know I'm on the 28th floor, and it doesn't know the difference between being here and being here. And this poses a challenge because two devices here and here that want to manifest a digital object in the same physical space are going to really struggle to do that. And if you've ever tried to set up any kind of shared AR experience where people really see things in the same place, then you have almost certainly played around with spatial anchors or digital twins or something like this, where essentially the way you position the devices is you compare the camera feeds to the two devices. That's essentially what it is. You create a 3D representation of the area you want to operate in, and then you try to compare each camera feed to the 3D representation of the area you want to be in. Uh, so if, for example, if you wanted to have a shared AR experience in Pokemon Go, uh, it takes about a minute to set that up. You have to scan a QR code on the other person's device. You have to stand next to each other, shoulder to shoulder. You have to point your phones at an object together. And then you have to start walking around the object slowly in the same direction. You have to do this for a while. Please bear with me. And then we are calibrated into the session. And now you decide that you wanna, you wanna join me and Andy in, in looking at this Pokemon, but that means Andy and I are gonna have to start over because everyone has to do this calibration at the same time, right? So positioning is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And what this means is that almost nobody has ever had uh, a shared AR experience where two people really look at something uh, at the same time. And I think that's what's missing. In fact, here's my controversial claim. If there was a pair of AR glasses out now that could only render text, black and white text, can't render a Pokemon, can't render a color image, can't render a 3D asset, it can only render text, but it can render the text in the same location for everybody, people would use those. Because what shared augmented reality allows us to do is to communicate at a much higher bandwidth. Information has context. It's kind of like, context is kind of like the compression algorithms that we use to communicate with each other. And when you can put information in its right physical place, you can communicate with me a lot faster. Just to have a little frivolous example here, if, if Andy and I are at a party, and some blowhard is just talking, 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 but Andy finds out that this guy's fly is open. The ability for him to just show me in space, a little text note, look at this fucker's fly is open, right? And I know who we're talking about. I know where the information is. Imagine how much it would take to communicate uh, to communicate that precisely. Or imagine you're in a city like Hong Kong, like I am, and you're star-crossed lovers across two different buildings, and you're trying to figure out in which window are you? It's like, no, 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 I'm right here. And then you can see, oh, do you see that thing happening down there? Imagine being able to point in 3D really, really accurately. Communication is what shared augmented reality 
is really for. I'm going to make another little bit of a controversial claim. Augmented reality is the longest running human technology project there is. We haven't, humanity has been working on AR longer than anything else because it turns out language itself is augmented reality. Let me explain, right? So if we were to imagine that we were walking through a forest together, right? And we came across a fallen tree and I point at that fallen tree and I say, hey guys, look at that beautiful couch. The moment I have said couch, something happens to your perception of the scene. You now see the sittingness of the tree if you didn't see it before. I've annotated your perception with additional context and meaning. This is what language is for. Language is for manifesting your knowledge and imagination in the minds of other people. Language is for manifesting your knowledge and imagination in the minds of other people. And this is what augmented reality allows us to do in theory, at least when it's shared at a much greater bandwidth than anything that has come before, than anything that has come before. And the only thing that will ever beat it is a direct neural interface. Shared augmented reality is the second to final train stop on this line, right? The direct neural interface, that's the final station. And shared augmented reality is the next to final station. And we are so close. The killer app for AR is the ability to be able to communicate with each other. I think right now, AR glasses are suffering. They're very big because they require a lot of compute. They drain a lot of battery because they're processing like really big images and they have to render all of these 3D objects. Who gives a shit, right? Like all of the app examples that Apple showed us, first of all, they never once showed a shared AR example in the Vision Pro uh, in, in the Vision Pro announcement. Not a single frame of two people wearing Vision Pros together. Even though they partner with Disney, the, the pro vision here is clearly we're going to watch Disney alone, right? As you do. Kind of sad, right? What's missing, what's missing is the ability to have shared augmented reality. And uh as Andy helpfully said in, in, in my intro, we're working on a protocol for collaborative spatial computing, meaning we allow the devices to understand space in real time together so that they can manifest information in space. Um, so yeah, that's my, my contrarian claim about the AR glasses. They will become consumer when they stop trying so hard to like render amazing 3D things and instead focus on what it is we will really use them for to communicate with each other. Uh, I've had long conversations with the guys at Qualcomm, et cetera, about this, um, you know, stop with the 3D and the expensive, just like, let's make a pair of glasses together that just renders text. Because I have huge international retailers that would use them immediately for their staff, right? Just, just the ability to be able to show staff members where things are supposed to be in the store, just a text label, like this is where the sugar goes, would save, you know, for someone like Walmart, that saves them tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of productivity every year. They'll buy those glasses. What's missing, what's missing is the ability to anchor position in an intersubjective way in space. And uh, in the spirit of, of the, the uh, very interesting presentation <clears throat> that Neil just gave, I want to talk a little bit about why it is uh, almost at a neurological level, we need this. Like, why do we have this drive to have shared experiences? And I want to talk a little bit about sensory congruence, sensory congruence. Let's start there. So uh, as humans, at least, but possibly even as biological beings, but at least as humans, a part of, a, of our uh, experience being alive is that our, our body, our brain, our mind tries very hard uh, to achieve sensory congruence. We want to make sure that the things that we see, that we hear, that we touch 
all match with each other. And whenever our senses don't agree with each other, it becomes jarring and actually uncomfortable. If you have a VLC or some video player like this uh, on your laptop, you can try to see what happens if you desync the audio with the video. Try to desync the audio, even by just a little bit. And notice how that feels in the body when the audio and the vision don't match up anymore. The need for sensory congruence is so deep that we even need external or social sensory congruence, right? I don't know why I'm typing this down, but we also need external sensory congruence. We need external sensory congruence. What does that mean? It means that when other people don't perceive what we perceive, that also feels weird. If you are the only person to not laugh at a joke, what does that feel like? If you are the only person that heard that cry for help, what does that feel like? We need external sensory congruence. We need external sensory congruence. And the reason why AR is trapped as a gimmick right now is because no one wants to return to AR because it actually feels uncomfortable to be the only person able to see the thing. It's not nice to be the only person that is able to see the thing. It messes with our very core of how we want to perceive the world, uh, how our body is at rest with our sensory inputs, and also how we are socially at rest with the rest of the tribe. Um, uh, a bit of a, 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 a mushroom-inspired psychedelic uh, insight is that an inside joke, what is that? An inside joke is proof of past intersubjectivity. It's proof that you previously had a moment of external sensory congruence. That's what an inside joke is. An inside joke is a way for you to demonstrate to each other that, hey, I was there. So uh, we say that Alki Labs is ultimately like, what is our purpose? What are we here to do? We are here to, to bring about shared understanding or intersubjectivity is the, the big word that we like to use. Our CRO doesn't like when I use this word intersubjectivity, it's too nerdy, but shared understanding. Right? We're trying to bring about shared understanding to allow people to manifest their knowledge and imagination in the minds of others. And the way we're going about doing that is through the medium of shared AR. That's what we're betting on. Right, We're betting on the medium of shared AR. Uh, and to do that, of course, we have to solve positioning. Uh, I've completely lost track of how I'm doing on, on time. Um, yeah, how am I on time? Uh, you, God, uh, like you have three, three more minutes left yeah. to talk. If you three like. more minutes. Okay. Then with those three more minutes, I think I want to show you what I'm talking about. Um, now, please excuse me that I'm opening up one of my decks. Uh, I don't want you to feel like I'm pitching you, but I, I kind of want to show you a few demos uh, just to show like how meaningful even just a text label in space can be. Uh, so I am gonna, gonna share my screen. I'll blast through this really, really quickly. Uh, I assure you, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I'm gonna open this deck anyhow. Okay, can you see my screen? Fantastic. So this nice peach little logo here with the mana rune, uh, we're Aoki. And uh, we say, share your vision, share your vision. Hopefully that makes sense now. We make what we call matterless domains, which is a kind of virtual real estate for shared augmented reality. Virtual real estate for shared augmented reality. We believe that shared augmented reality allows you to, I'm saying it again, manifest your knowledge and imagination in the minds of other people. And that this is something so important, so impactful, that it genuinely represents the next historical leap not only for human language, but for our ability to understand each other and even the machines that surround us. Augmented reality is a really big deal. Our unique solution is powered by this thing we call the PostMesh, which is our decentralized protocol for collaborative spatial computing. And 
our vision is that by providing this canvas for shared AR, that the PostMesh will become the foundational protocol, not only for positioning, but for the AR metaverse and even AI and robotics ability to perceive and interact with the physical world on earth and beyond. Simply put, you know, if we strip all of this down, what is it we do? We're building the AR metaverse from the ground up by providing virtual real estate to commercial real estate. Why would they want it? Let me show you a demo, right? And all the demos I'm going to show you, this is actual footage, no CGI, no bullshit. It looks janky, so you know it's real, right? It looks janky, so you know it's real. Um, and I'm going to play this here. I'm going to turn the audio off and just illustrate. This is our demo space in Hong Kong, a fake grocery store. And a colleague of mine has left a note for me with a shelf that he found that was busted. And he doesn't know how to fix it. So he left a note for me so I can find it and go and fix it. Right? He just left a note. What does this mean? It means he didn't have to go find me. He didn't have to walk me over to the place. He could connect with me asynchronously. Now, as you saw, fixing that shelf was obviously very, very simple. This is a, clearly a stage thing, but the principle is the same. Uh, if I hop on over to the next slide here, maybe. Uh, what this allows you to do is like communicate more effectively across time with each other. You can communicate more effectively across time with each other because you can leave information in space where it's supposed to be. Um, and for retailers, this is this is massive. Like, for example, just to show like how economics really will drive glasses adoption here or even uh, phones for AR. Right. Uh, if you are a European retailer like Lidl, you have 13,000 grocery stores. You have 13,000 grocery stores. And if you can speed up the um, if you can speed up the tasks that are inside the grocery store for the people that are on the floor that have to find things, restock, relabel, do these kinds of things by just five percent, right? So instead of something taking four minutes to do, it just takes you know three minutes, fifty seconds. If you can shave off those seconds because people find the issue faster at the scale of one of these retailers. That's worth on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars every year, hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Uh, so I, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. But yeah, my controversial take is that we are not waiting for smaller headsets. We're not waiting for more realistic graphics. We're just waiting for the ability to use AR to communicate with each other. Uh, it's, that's amazing. I totally agree. Um, I think that was a big miss in uh, Apple pitch of not showing really social any interaction with others besides maybe like they kicks a ball and your kid is in there and you're sort of interacting with that but other than that it was really not social that, that i noticed in there yet as well um so yeah it's really really strong um okay so and in great demos you didn't say you said you're not going to do a demo but you did it was really on really on thank you um so a uh, couple questions for you Oh, here come the questions. They're rolling up. Um, so, is there any input on the use of the AR tech using classrooms? Yeah, like I thought that 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 solar system model. I think it definitely lends to to interaction. And my my daughter might have some questions too, as a kid. Uh, we have a lot of educators telling us that they want to use this as an educational tool. And I think it's very, very possible to use this as an educational tool. We have a Unity SDK out so that you can start building your uh, own applications for this. Uh, you can go to alkylabs.com and click your way through until you find our SDK. You can, you can download it and you can start building shared experiences yourself. One of the things that I think is challenging uh, with education. It's a complete business thing. It's very hard to find the people that will pay uh, for the thing. Like the teachers want this, but who's who's buying it? Uh, who do you talk to to sell it? Like there's a, a an operational complexity there in selling these kinds of educational solutions that I think is holding back the educational space. It makes it very hard for startups that want to make uh, applications uh, for education because it's a very tricky long sales cycle um yeah yeah well we, all, we got walmart too so yeah i know i know someone who works for uh the the walmart out of hoboken over here so if you want to contact over there definitely you know their lab hoboken in jersey so 
I'm glad to put you in touch with them if you like. Um, she's part of the Happy natural language processing parts, as well as an Amazon. I know an Amazon guy here too. So anyway, we're glad to put you in touch. Um, cool, yeah, but I also mentioned ZSpace on the chat because that's a company I knew when I worked for, for Merck um, doing education, but yeah, definitely it's, it's, it's hard. Um, okay, uh, the, how easy is it to update the virtual space when the physical space is, I'm not sure what they mean, what new end means by modified, but um, maybe not like a perfectly like rectangular space or there's a lot of um, obstacles in there, but maybe new one can clarify that. But yeah, how easy is it to update this virtual space? I have a you suspicion know, that Nguyen means like what happens if the physical space changes, like if you remodel everything. And yes, uh, and uh, Nguyen's question is rooted in like the deep shared trauma of the AR space that positioning is done with digital twins, right? Positioning is done with digital twins. So if you change the physical space, surely you broke everything, right? Because that's how digital twins work. And we've just internalized this by now. But uh, Nguyen, what we do is so stupidly simple, right? We use QR codes. Each QR code is unique. And then we use AR tech to measure the distance of the QR codes and each QR code becomes a portal into the space. So if you move the shelf, doesn't matter. The portal still works. If you had some um, material anchored to that shelf, sure. Uh, you're gonna have to move that thing unless you are anchoring it with some kind of, of, of computer, computer vision. But the coordinate system doesn't break down because you move a shelf. And what's cool with this also is that since we're only doing this with, with QR codes, you can set up an entire grocery store really in minutes, right? So our demo space is about a thousand square feet. And when I really want to impress a customer, I will take uh, everything down, right? I'll just like, hey, let's set this up from the beginning together, right? And the only step I don't do is place the QR codes because like that physical labor, they, they don't want to see me do that. So we've done the first step, the QR codes are on the ground. Then all we have to do is we walk with our phone uh, from one QR code to the other, just measuring the distance. Now we've set up a, a, a coordinate system. Now we can open up one of many, many apps that can connect to this coordinate system and just start placing content. So the fastest demo I've ever done of from, from having nothing to having three different applications running in the virtual real estate. One note keeping a thing for staff, one promotional thing for the shoppers and a game that the shoppers can play, 10 minutes, right? So from zero to having three different applications running in the space, 10 minutes. Awesome. Uh, we just have time for one more question. I'm just gonna ask you uh, uh, really quick uh, and we have to move on. Um, but as in terms of uh, uh, an object being uh, real or fake, so if, if, someone, if someone is experiencing if two people are experiencing an object in their environment shared, does that change how the augmented reality experience is 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 perceived in the brain? Like, if if someone's if someone's uh, uh, viewing an augmented reality experience alone and no one else could see it, um, does that tell the brain that maybe it's not really there versus the, the other way around? So when we use the language of in the brain, I can only yeah. say probably but as a matter of like your consciousness yeah definitely like you can try this for yourself and we we see this all the time right like if you've looked at something on your own cool but if two people see it together like if we're watching an ar dog together for example and you see me reach out and touch that dog right that does something and we see when we talk to people in our demo space that they will point towards things. Like even once they've put the devices down, they will point in space towards the things that they saw because it's still there in like their spatial context, right? That thing over there that they saw. And I think this is what shared augmented reality allows you to do. It kind of allows you to paint a physical space with new emotional contexts. Sorry to be a little bit hippy dippy. But this is really, really powerful. When other people have seen what you see, it, it, it feels more real. You can trust that it's there. Reality is that which we perceive together. Like that's what reality is. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Nils. Com very compelling talk. Uh, and feel free to post your LinkedIn or email, whatever, however you'd like to be contacted in the chat uh, in case. I'm happy to share my LinkedIn. Give me a second. And also, I would love to just share a link with everybody. Um, yeah. There's a 
fantastic, one of my favorite science fiction authors, Alistair Reynolds. You may be familiar with his work if you watch Love, Death, Robots. He wrote two of the episodes, uh, Sima Blue and Beyond the Aquila Rift. Uh, he recently wrote a short story that's on our blog about why we need to be careful about visual positioning, like why we need to be careful about letting companies uh, like Google, like Niantic, et cetera, actually position our devices by looking through the camera. You should definitely, definitely, definitely read this story. It's super riveting, and uh, it gives you a lot to think about uh, for the future of AR, because the future of AR is not necessarily uh, just positive. I'm going to pull up my... I'm going to pull up my LinkedIn here and share. Actually, I think I know the link by heart. It's just uh, linkedin.com slash IN slash my name, like so. That's me on LinkedIn. I see some of you have reached out already. Uh, happy to connect. Awesome. Thank you, Nils. Really good having you here. Nice talk. Thank you uh, for having me. It's been a, yeah. been a pleasure. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, next up, I'm excited to introduce uh, Christopher Grayson, creative director, marketing consultant, and veteran of the New York advertising industry. He has produced mark 